today we are going to talk about pride understanding pride and I'm gonna show you how King Saul remember we're looking at his life because his life is what illustrates the New Testament truths that Paul preached that if you live after the flesh you're going to lose the kingdom and ultimately it wants to produce death in our lives right and so Paul preached that very strongly to the Ephesians to the Galatians and to the Romans he told the Romans make no provision for the flesh and then he told them why because you will lose the kingdom not heaven but your experience of the will of God where on earth amen and so the flesh <clears throat> knows it can't keep you out of heaven it knows that but it's working to try to keep heaven from coming to the earth in your life amen and so King Saul is a perfect example a perfect illustration of what happens when we yield or make provision for the flesh and so uh, in his life we can see things that he did that enabled the flesh to sit in the driver's seat and ultimately stop him from fulfilling his destiny amen and so one of the things that he did you remember last week we looked at uh, the three D's we looked at dishonesty deception and discernment a lack of discernment amen and so we talked about those last week this week we're going to talk about pride understanding pride because pride is a work of the flesh it is a footman of the flesh it's a lynchman and and the flesh sends out pride as a foot soldier as a henchman to take us out and today we're going to see how subtle pride is buckle in it's going to be great you're going to really see how pride actually finds its way into all of our lives we're going to look at pride from a different angle you're going to see pride today in a way that you may have never seen pride but we're going to see what we're going to understand how pride tries to find its way into the believer's life. Amen. All right. So let's <clears throat> let's jump right in today. Go to uh, we said Romans 13. Look at what he says here in verse 14. He says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and what make no provision for the flesh. Amen. And so we are told in scripture to make absolutely no provision for the flesh. And we said because it will rob us of experiencing the kingdom of God and ultimately it is seeking to kill us. Now let's go pick right up where we left off last week. Go to 1 Samuel 15 and we're going to continue studying the life of King Saul. <clears throat> and are you guys seeing how this Old Testament story actually substantiates and gives credence to the New Testament truth yes. of making no provision for the flesh? Are you seeing how he, how, how, how he dealt with the Amalekites is wisdom for us to deal with the flesh today? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so notice what he says here. 1 Samuel 15 and look at verse we left off last week in verse 15 we're going to pick up this week with verse 16 through uh through 19 three verses this morning first samuel 15 verse 16 through 19 and we're going to talk this morning about pride so notice what he says here then samuel said to saul stay and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me. And, uh, and so uh, Samuel said to him, say on. And Samuel said, verse 17, when you were little in your own sight. Notice, when you were little in your own sight. 
God made you the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And so notice he's no longer little in his own sight. He's what? He's big. He sees himself as smarter than God. God says, kill the Amalekites. He thinks he knows more than God. He doesn't kill them. He disobeys because he doesn't trust. You know, every time we disobey, it's because we don't believe. Whatever is not of faith is sin. The reason we sin is because we don't really believe. Amen? Amen? And so he's, he's disobeying because he thinks he knows more than God. Amen? And so notice this. He, he's no longer little in his own eyes. And Samuel is telling him, when you were little, the anointing of God came on you. The power of God came on you. The ability of God came on you. You were made a king when you were God dependent. When you were little, when you realized that you couldn't do it, only God could. That's when God flowed through you and you saw his power. But basically what he's telling them is you don't see yourself like that anymore. Now you're big in your own eyes. You're big in your own eyes. It goes on to say, and Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a journey and said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Here's another proof text to show you that the Amalekites represent the flesh. Because what part of us or what, what tempts us to sin? It's the flesh. It's the Amalekite. Amen. And so he doesn't call any other nation in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does God refer to a nation as sinners. He always calls them by their name. The Canaanite, the Jebusite, the Girgashite, the Hittite. But when he talks about the Amalekites, he calls them the sin principle, the sinners, the part that tempts you to go. It's an enemy. It moves you away from God. So they represent the flesh. Amen. And so notice what he says here. I told you to go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they're consumed. Now look at this. You did what, wherefore then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? You know why he didn't obey the voice of the Lord? Pride. He was big in his own eyes. He was no longer little. He was no longer God dependent. Can everyone see that? Now that is very clear and we don't need to teach on that because every one of you know that pride is an overestimation of yourself. It's being inflated, right? Full of yourself, correct? It's thinking that you are bigger than you are. We all know that that's pride, right? Now, listen to me, and here's where we're going to take a turn. This verse in the actual Hebrew is phrased differently. It's constructed differently and it gives us a different view of pride. <clears throat> and this is what we're going to talk about this morning. This verse in the actual Hebrew is structured parenthetically and it's phrased as a question. I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to look in the New Living Translation because it's the easiest, most accurate place to see what God is really saying here and buckle in because this is going to be good. Now notice what this actually says in the Hebrew and you're going to see the difference here. In the Hebrew it actually reads this way. Art not thou, are you not, even if you are little in your own eyes, the head of the tribes of Israel. I'm going to read it one more time. Are not thou, even if you are little in your own eyes. Can you see the difference? The King James emphasizes when you were little. Meaning you're no longer little in your own eyes. You're now what? Full of yourself. You're big in your own eyes, right? 
so you're not trusting God. But the actual Hebrew words it, the Hebrew words it this way. He says, when, he says, are you not the king of Israel? And then in the middle, he has a parenthesis, a phrase in the middle, even if you are little in your own eyes, aren't you still the king? In other words, what uh, Samuel was saying to, to King Saul was, you are the king, but you don't recognize who you are. You see yourself and you think little of yourself instead of recognizing that God anointed you and you're a king. In other words, the actual Hebrew is saying he sinned because he didn't recognize who he was. And the Bible is still calling this pride. Now here's where you probably have never applied pride. Listen to me closely here. Pride at its core is self-centeredness. Pride at its core is simply self-centeredness instead of Christ-centeredness. Look at the word pride, even the spelling of the word. P R I D E. P R on the front, D E on the back, what's in the center? I. Pride is self centeredness at its core. Pride, listen to me, focuses on us instead of God. Whether that focus makes us little in our own eyes, as in the Hebrew text, or whether that focus makes us big, inflated, and overestimation in our own eyes, as the King James says, it's still pride. Pride doesn't care how you see yourself, whether it's an overestimation of self or an underestimation of self, whether it's you see yourself big or you see yourself little, pride doesn't care. Pride just wants you full of yourself. You with me, Damien? Now I was praying, now I had never seen this before. And I saw both texts, I saw the Hebrew, I've always read the King James my whole life, but I saw the actual, literal Hebrew text, how it's actually, what actually is said in Hebrew, which we read here. We're going to read this in the New Living in a little bit. And I prayed, I said, Father, which one is it? Was Saul big in his own eyes, as the King James is conveying, or was he little in his own eyes, as the Hebrew is conveying? And God answered me and he said, it's both. Pride is simply self-centeredness. It's being full, whether you're full in an overestimation or in an un underestimating yourself, devaluing a poor self-image. Pride doesn't care how you see yourself. It just wants you to see you. You, you follow me? That's pride. And this is what got this man to fall. And I'm going to show you how subtle pride is. It's a lynchman. It's a footman. It does the dirty work. And it's subtle. You don't even realize many times that you are in pride. And we're going to show you how to locate pride in this, uh, in this message today. Amen. Now, I'm going to read this to you out of the New Living Translation, and I want you to hear it because the New Living is actually the closest translation to the literal Hebrew. Listen to this in the New Living. He says, And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself. How many of you can identify with that? Man, I can't tell you how many times I don't recognize who I am, my position 
and my power. As a father, I don't recognize always my words and the power it has over my children. As a husband, I don't recognize even my attitude. The ignoring when your wife is talking to you. Did you hear me? I don't even know. I, didn't, I can't even answer. Are you listening to me, Jarrell? I'm still watching the game. Or maybe if my wife shares something with me and I, and I just ignore it or shrug it off, I don't realize my power in her life as her husband. You follow me? As a pastor, I don't always realize my power over my words, my attitude, my position. You know what that is? Now we would never call it this. This is why pride is dangerous. This is why we're going to unmask pride today. It's pride. Even when, see, li listen to what he says here. He says, and Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? Look at that. He's calling this pride. He's saying, you are the king. And God anointed you. You are responsible for, for these people and to lead them. And he said, the reason you failed is because you see yourself little. And the Bible is saying this is pride. It's just, what is pride? Self-centeredness. P-R-I-D-E. It doesn't care if you see yourself big or little. Pride doesn't care if you overestimate or underestimate, if you're inflated or deflated, if you, have a, if you think more high than you ought to or if you think less. It doesn't care. It just wants you focusing on you instead of who God made you. A king anointed by God. When we don't realize that we are kings, when we don't realize our power and our position as wives, as husbands, as parents, as friends, when we don't recognize who we are in Christ, that we're the righteousness of God, that we're healthy, blessed, the lender, not the borrower, full of wisdom, full of peace, full of joy. When we come down from that place and see ourselves less than what the word says we're anointed to do, that's what the Bible calls pride. But we would never say that's pride. And that's how pride is slipping in our lives. Again, pride doesn't care how you see yourself. It just wants you to see yourself. Are you with me? Yes. All right, now let's keep going. And we're going to make it clear as we go. So, <clears throat> pride is simply self-centeredness instead of Christ-centeredness. Whether we view ourselves big or little, it's all pride. Now, where in your life, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna call pride now an incorrect view. Pride is an incorrect view. It's a view that is out of alignment with the Word of God. That's pride. Whether that view is thinking more highly of yourself instead of soberly, correctly, or whether that view is thinking less of yourself, it's pride. Now, where in your life are there incorrect views? All of us have them. Where in your life are there incorrect views? In what areas of your life are you overestimating yourself, seeing yourself big instead of believing and trusting God? But here's the clincher. In what areas of your life are you underestimating yourself, seeing yourself little instead of believing who you are in Christ and trusting God? Either one of these incorrect views of ourselves is pride. And it's deadly. Pride is simply, listen to me please, get this, pride is simply unbelief. Whether that unbelief leads you to be self-dependent, big in your own eyes, or whether that belief leads you to have a poor self-image, it's still unbelief. 
pride at its core is unbelief. You look at you instead of looking to God, which would be faith. Is everyone with me? Now, I'm going to show you how God showed me to understand pride. I'm going to show you how God taught me how to understand what pride is. And I'm going to show you in the scripture a definition of pride. Okay? Now, this isn't the only way to define pride. Please, we're using this definition of pride in this series because that's what Saul was doing. Okay? There are many ways to describe pride, probably ways we don't even know, but what God shows us, let's walk in that. Amen? Amen. All right, now, let's, let's show you that pride is simply unbelief. Go with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Is everybody with me this morning? Okay, James chapter 4. <clears throat> and you're going to see very clearly how to see what pride is. All right, James chapter 4, and notice what he says here in verse 6. He says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud. Who does God resist? People who are in pride. He resists the proud, correct? But watch this. He gives grace to who? People who are humble. Okay, now, now follow me now. God is saying that humble people will receive something from God. What is it? Grace. Everybody can see that, right? You don't need a five years of seminary to see that, correct? Humble people, God gives them grace. Proud people are restricted or God resists them. They're restricted from God's grace. So grace is the inheritance of humble people. Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. Okay, now. I'm going to show you enough. Now, this verse also is quoted in, I'm not going to turn there for sake of time. You can write it down if you're taking notes. 1 Peter 5.5 5 quotes the, the exact same verse, and you all know that. Now, I'm going to show you another verse that says clearly grace comes to people who are in faith. So right here you see in James 4.6 and 1 Peter 5.5 5, that grace comes to people who are humble. But I'm going to show you a verse of scripture that says grace comes to people who are in faith. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2 and 8. Look at what he says here in verse 8. He says, For by grace are you saved, how? Through faith. By grace are you saved through what? Through faith. So in Ephesians 2 and 8, he says, The grace of God comes to people who are in faith. But in James chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Grace comes to people who are humble. Which one is it? Does grace come to people who are humble? Or does grace come to people who are in faith? It's both. Listen to me. A humble person believes God. He's in faith. He submits to what God says about him. He believes God's word. Listen to me. A prideful people doesn't believe what God says about him. Grace comes to the humble, but it also comes to those who are in faith. Are they two different people? No. A humble person is in faith. And a prideful person, listen to me, is an unbelief. This is what Saul did. This is what Samuel was telling him. You're the king, but you don't believe it. 
you see yourself little. Or, you, as the King James says, you see yourself beyond and no, no longer are you trusting God as the source of your anointing, wisdom, and strength. Where in your life, listen to me, if we're, if we're using the Bible to define pride, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. Ephesians 2 and 8. He gives grace to those who are in faith. Who, who does grace look for? Is it a faith person or a humble person? It's both. A humble person is in faith. Listen to me. When you're in pride, you're in unbelief. What areas in your life are you in unbelief? Listen to me. That area is where you're in pride. What area in your life are you not believing who God says you are? Maybe you're dealing with a sickness. God says, by my stripes, you were, past tense, meaning you is, <laughs> meaning you are, you are healed. That's what God's word says. But you feel something else. The test says something different. We're not denying the test. We're not denying what you feel. We're not denying what can be picked up with, you know, medical science. We're not denying it. But what we are denying is for that to be the truth that governs my life. Are you going to believe? Listen to me. Here's how pride comes in. If, if, that, if you see yourself as being sick, Instead of what God says you are, listen to me, I'm saying this with all due respect. I am not saying this to hurt you. I'm helping you to locate pride. That's pride. T pride is simply unbelief. Even if you see yourself less than what God says you are, that's pride. See, we wouldn't call that pride. We call that, in the religion, being humble. It's actually pride. We're calling good evil and evil good. Pride doesn't care. How, again, I want to say this so you, so you get this, because we've never heard pride taught this way. Pride doesn't care how you see yourself. It just wants you to see you. So it tells you you're sick. If you start seeing yourself sick instead of how God says, God told King Saul, you're a king and I've anointed you. But he didn't see himself like that. That's pride. God says you're a lender, you're not a borrower. You're the head, you're not the tail. You have wisdom, understanding that he's filled you with knowledge, insight. All the treasures of wisdom are now in you. Do you know the Bible actually says that? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. And guess where Christ is? In you. Do you know you have the mind of Christ? You're beautiful. You're smart. You're intelligent. You have God's favor. But things don't always work out the way we plan or the way we thought. Sometimes you put your glasses down, you can't find your glasses, and you think, how do I have the mind of Christ? And they were on top of your head the whole time. Right? You're looking for your car key, and the whole time it was in your back pocket. Right? And you think, how do I have the mind of Christ? I can't even find my glasses, and they're on top of my head the whole time. You actually do, but listen to me. When we allow situations and things to tell us, or to get us to come down wow. in our way of thinking. Th listen to me, this is, I just want you to get this. That's what the Bible is calling pride. Pride is simply unbelief. He gives grace to the humble, but he also gives grace to those who are in faith. Proud people don't get grace, why? Because they're not in faith. Pride is unbelief. 
whether you see yourself big or little, whether that belief, unbelief causes you to be a God hater, which none of you are, or whether that unbelief causes you to be humble. I'm not literally meaning humble. I'm talking about like how religion, you know, you see yourself, well, you know. That's pride. That's pride. Are you seeing yourself little today or are you seeing yourself anointed with God's power, kings unto our God? How do you see yourself in your finances? How are you seeing yourself? Are you seeing yourself? This is why the offering is so important. Because you get to demonstrate what you believe from the word. God's word says that he supplies all. That he has put, if, how many of you are made right with God? Do you know all of you, if your faith is in Jesus, all of you online, if your faith is in Jesus, you are right with God. Do you realize Psalm 112 says, in the house of righteous people, that's all of you. The Bible says there are wealth and riches in your home. Physically in your house, wealth and riches is there. You, right now, if you are right with God, all of you are, you are wealthier beyond, you, you are prosperous right now. But you may not see it. Now, the Bible says that wealthy people, look, turn here, go to Psalm 112. Let me show you this. I'm just trying to make this applicable so that you can see how we are letting pride in. If we're dealing with a sickness, how do we let pride in? Whenever we, we start adjusting our lives to that sick, we see ourselves with this allergy, with this problem, with this respiratory problem. We see ourselves that way instead of seeing ourselves the way God's word says, any area where we are in unbelief, listen to me, we're in pride. C can you see, are you seeing that? When God showed me this, this, and I'm going to show you what pride is after in a second. But pride is simply at its core, self-centeredness instead of Christ. I'm not focused on what he, I got a sickness, Lord. God says you're healed. No, no, I got a sickness. That's pride. God says, you're rich, you're pro No, 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 God, I'm in debt. I can't pay. No, no, you're blessed. You have all sufficiency in all things. I am taking. No, 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 God, you don't understand. Look how much is in my account. God is saying, I know that right now in your hand are two pieces of fish and only five pieces of bread, and you got to feed 5,000 with that. But look to me from whence your help comes. I am supplying you. There's a heavenly account. You know the Bible says you have a heavenly account? Philippians chapter 2, you have a heavenly account beyond your chase account here on the earth. Beyond what your Chase app is telling you, your Bible app is telling you that you're loaded. But you know how you withdraw that? Faith, humility, belief. You have to humble yourself and what? Believe. Pride says, no God, I would love to give, but I can't. I've got 19 bills due. And I don't have enough to even pay those 19 bills. Jesus says, I know I had 5,000 people to feed and I didn't have anywhere near the amount of food to feed them. But I look to him, not to me. Pride is self-centeredness. He didn't look to himself to meet those needs. He lifted them, gave thanks to the Father and looked to God. What is pride? You focus on you. Uh, humility is you focus on God. It, are, are you seeing this? I pray you are. This, this can literally change your life. All right, now watch this. Psalm 112. Look at what he says here. Verse 1. He says, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears 
God. You know what the fear of God is? It's, it's belief. It's faith in God. You respect God. How many of you respect God? You believe God. You fear the Lord. Do you know what the Bible says about you? You're blessed. Look at what else he says. That delights greatly in his commandments. Watch this. His seed shall be mighty on the earth. That's your children. You say, well, well you don't understand what's going on. It doesn't matter what's going on with them right now. You, if you are, if you belong to God, God has a promise. Your seed will be mighty, influential, prosperous, significant in the earth. But you have to believe that. Humble yourself and submit to it. Amen. Now notice what else he says here. He says wealth and riches shall be in his house. Whose house? Look at this. Those whose righteousness endures forever. Do you realize every one of you, your righteousness is enduring forever because Jesus is your righteousness and he lives after the power of an endless life. You are in Christ. God sees you righteous not because of what you've done. He sees you righteous because you're in his son. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Do you understand that Jesus was made sin with our sins? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God just as Jesus was made sinful, excuse me, just as Jesus was made sin without committing an act of sin, you have been made right with God without committing a single righteous act. You are not righteous because you have done something right. Any more than Jesus was made sin because he sinned. He never sinned, yet he was made sin. You are right with God without doing anything right. <laughs> Amen. You are the righteousness of God and you can't lose it. It endures forever. Guess what comes with that righteous package? You know, when you go to your job, when you sign up for your job and you start working there, they sit you down and they say, now these are your benefits. Do you realize the Bible tells you you have benefits? They're all listed in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. What's the first one? He forgives your sin. That's when you sign the offer letter. That's accepting the job. The forgiveness of sins is signing the offer letter. Once you sign that, what comes next? He'll heal all your diseases. That's a benefit. He'll redeem your life from destruction. He'll crown your head with loving kindness. He'll satisfy your mouth with good things. He'll renew your youth like the eagle. He won't deal with you after your sins anymore. That's your benefits package. Once you sign the offer letter, he gave you an offer letter. Will you be my child, my bride? You said yes, you accepted it. It came with benefits. The Bible says don't forget the benefits. You have them. And one of those benefits is wealth and riches is in your house. That's a benefit of the righteous. You say, well, Jarell, I don't see that right now. Because you have to mix faith with it. What do people who are right with God, who are wealthy and rich do? Skip down to the verse. Look at what he does. Verse 9. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So what do righteous people do who have righteousness enduring forever? What do they do with their wealth? They disperse. They give to the poor. How do you give to the poor? Now let me say this here. How do you give to the poor? Thanks, Renetta. Let me say this here. Listen to me. Here's how you give to the poor. Now we, listen to me please, because I'm not saying that, that you know, if you see someone, you know, let, let, let me say this. Jesus said... To the poor, the gospel is preached. He said, the, the lame, I came to make them walk. The blind, I came to make them see. The deaf, I came to make them hear. The dead, I came to raise them to life. And to the poor, what's his solution? I came to preach to him the gospel. Listen to me, the way according to the Bible that you support the poor is you give them the gospel. You, you, you chain, poverty is not, poverty is the result of sin. That's good. It came in after Adam's sin. It is spiritual. It is not just physical and racial and social. It is spiritual. And the only thing that will break the power of poverty is the gospel. 
That's what 2 Corinthians 9 says. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet he became poor only at the cross. He was not born poor. His family was poor. We know that because of the offering they bring. And the, the law, if you were poor, you had to bring turtle doves. If you were rich, you brought a lamb. What did Mary and them bring? A turtle dove. They were poor. They didn't, they didn't have anything. But as soon as he showed up in their life, kings. How many kings? It's not what the Bible says. See, we see the nativity scenes in people's yard. Three kings sitting out. Doesn't say how many kings. It says kings brought three gifts. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Could have been 300 kings. Could have been two kings. We just know it was in the plural. Kings. We don't know how many. Kings came bringing three gifts. Gold. So his family who was poor, as soon as he came into their life, he made them wealthy. Jesus is still making families wealthy today. He's still coming into your life to bring wealth and riches to you. He's still doing that. That's his will. That's his will. So he who was rich became poor. When did he become poor? At the cross. He was not rich on the earth. Uh, he was not poor on the earth. He was not. You go have a, 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 a business and have one of your employees stealing from you. And yet your business is still able to run. Uh, Judas was stealing money from the bag and yet they were still able to do and meet the needs of so many people he lacked nothing he was blessed of God he was Abraham's seed he was prosperous he lacked nothing when did he become poor at the cross the Galatians 3 13 said he was made a curse for us the, the poverty is under the curse that's when he became poor so that you through his poverty might be made rich Physically. Po Listen to me, poverty is spiritual. Jesus took it at the cross to make you rich. Rich is spiritual. It's not linked to your education, your color, your gender, your social standing. Prosperity is the result of receiving grace. There is a grace to prosper. And, and the way you receive it is by believing and then acting on the word. Giving. That's what he's saying here. Wealth and riches is in the house of a righteous man. And what does that righteous man do? He supports the gospel. That's how he releases that wealth. Listen to me. You might say, Jarrell, I don't have wealth and riches in my house right now. I can't see it. Can you support the gospel? Wow. Let me say it another way. Can you act like you believe? you're wealthy and rich because what do wealthy rich people do according to the Bible what do they do they give to the gospel so right now you might not have wealth and riches in your home but can you act in faith on the word like you already have it start giving to the gospel once you start giving to the gospel you'll release the reality through your faith can you see it? Can you, can you all see that? You'll release it. Amen? Amen? And so what I'm trying to get you to see is pride, pride is simply unbelief. Can everybody see that? Is everybody seeing that? It's just unbelief. Where are we in unbelief? That's where we're in pride. Amen? Amen? Notice this now. He says here, All right, now here's where I want to, where I, I need to wrap up now. Here's where I need to wrap this up. Now listen to me. Pride is after our belief system. That's really what it's after. It just wants to get us out of faith. Because it knows if it gets us out of faith, it can disconnect us from God's grace. God's power to live a successful life. Remember, he only gives grace to who? The humble. But the proud, yeah, and the, and the faithful. But the proud are what? Restricted from that grace. So what does pride do? 
Pride wants to restrict us from the grace of God. So how does it do it? It gets us out of faith. Instead of looking to God. That's why we use the example of finances and health. God says you're rich. You don't see it. Pride says you're poor. God says you're rich. Which one are you going to believe? If you believe you're poor and then you act like it, you don't support the gospel, you don't give, you don't tithe, you don't give offerings, you don't give your first fruit. If you act in agreement with what pride is telling you or with what unbelief is telling you, that's actually pride. If you see yourself sick instead of by my stripes you're healed, you're focused on you, God, I have a sickness. God says, no, you have healing. No, I have sickness. No, I have healing. You're in, you're self, it's, it, pride is just focusing on you. Is everybody with me? Now, pride is ultimately after our belief system. That's all it wants to attack because it wants to limit you from God's grace. That's all it's trying to do. Now, why does pride want to limit us from God's grace? Listen to me. Because it has the same agenda on its mind as the flesh does. It is a henchman for the flesh. What does the flesh want to do? Two things. Strip us of the kingdom. And it wants to kill us. kill us, produce death. Do you know that pride has the same agenda? It's a henchman. It's a footman for, for the flesh. It wants to strip you of the kingdom. It wants to kill you. But it comes behind you, subtle. You don't even know you're in it. It tells you you're being humble. It tells you you're being responsible. You can't give. Well, I guess Jesus was being responsible too when he had 5,000 people to feed. And he said, tell everybody to sit down, I'll feed them. How can you take that responsibility on yourself to feed 5,000 people? You got nothing in your hand. I have nothing, but he has something in his hand. See, pride, focus, that's what I'm just trying to get. Pride is focusing you on you. Every area in your life, whether it's finance, if you're not giving, you're in pride. I, I'm, I'm not saying that to hurt you. I'm, I'm trying to help you see this is what pride is after. Are you seeing what I'm saying, Damon? If you're seeing yourself sick, I'm not saying stop taking your medicine. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is start now to begin to renovate that inner image. Start moving, meditating on the scriptures. I'm healed. I'm healthy. Speak to yourself in the mirror. There lies a man healthy, full of strength, full of vigor, full of life. With long life, you will be satisfied. You will not die until you are satisfied. Speak over your children. Maybe they're doing horrible in school and you think, man, what's wrong with them? Speak over them. You're mighty on the earth. You're blessed. God is bringing right people around you. He's surrounding you with favor. He protects you. You are blessed. You are taught of the Lord. When you go out today, yes, you might have other people in your life, but you'll listen to his voice more than their voice. Pride is just not believing. Okay, so let's, let's just show you this. So what is, what, is, what is pride after? It ultimately is trying to rob us of the grace of God. Why is it trying to rob us from the grace of God? Because the grace of God only comes to who? The humble and those who are in faith. Everybody with me, right? So look at what pride is after. Go to Romans 5 and we're going to look at a verse that all of you know, but maybe you didn't see that this is the MO of pride. Romans chapter 5. I hope you guys are getting this this morning. Man, I, 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 this could be literally life-changing if you, if you can get this. Because we would have never called those areas pride. Never. We always look at pride as an in, you're full of yourself. But we never looked at it as being full of yourself either way. To either extreme, it doesn't matter as long as you're still full of yourself. It doesn't matter. What, it doesn't matter how you see yourself, whether it's little or big, it's just being full of self. It's pride. It doesn't matter if that self looks little. It's like uh, Damon has this camera here. He can turn that camera and, and pull in or pull out. It doesn't matter what he's doing. It's still a focus. Whether it's zooming in or zooming out, it doesn't care. It just wants to focus you and make you full of you. That's pride. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right. Now, I'm not angry. I'm just excited, okay? I'm not angry at anybody. I, 
want to make sure, I, I, you all know I'm not angry at you, right? I'm just passionate, I'm, try <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to see this, all right? Now watch this, Romans 5, look at this, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, now watch this, much more they which receive abundance of grace. Stop. Look at me. Stop. All of you watching online. Look at me. Stop. Who, what kind of people receive abundance of grace? Proud people or humble people? Humble. humble. So right here, if we are going to qualify or meet the criteria of this verse, what do we have to do to qualify for this verse? We have to be what? Humble. Now what happens once I start receiving grace? Look at the two things that happen when I receive grace. Number one, let's read. Read, the, read it to me. Ready? Read. For, all right, let, let's, let's, all right, all right, okay, all right. All right, here, hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, watch this. For the, watch this, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive, that you can, you can simply cross out receive there and put be humble. Or be humble and what else? Be in faith. People who are humble are people who are in faith. People who are prideful are people who are in unbelief. What area are you in unbelief? That's where you're in pride. What area are you in faith? That's where you're being humble. And grace, just look at the areas of your life. I, I, I dare you to look at the areas of your life where you are humble, where you are God dependent. You're not even thinking about you, taking no thought what you shall eat, what you shall drink. Wherewithal shall you be called? You're just trusting God. They told you you were going to die. You said, I don't care. And you got healed. They told you you were going to put you at the house. You said, they said, we're going to cut off the electricity. And you said, we're going to have a candlelight service. Amen. Amen. And what happened? God came through. Grocery showed up at the door. Check out every air. Calm down, Jarrell. Check out every air. I'm not mad at you. I'm trying to get you to see this. Yeah. Check out every area of your life where you didn't care. Amen. Where you weren't focused on you. Where you casted all your care on him. You weren't being in pride. You weren't in unbelief. You knew God had you. That's good. Every time God came through for you. But when you were trying to figure out how am I going to do it. Staying up light at, late at night. Going to bed late. Being full of sorrow. You didn't receive from God. Wow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It didn't work, right? That's what, it's trying to keep the grace of God from coming to you. Because it knows only the humble. Only those who trust God. Who cast their care on him who look to him those are the ones who receive grace and when you receive grace guess what happens you reign the kingdom Amen. a king reigns you reign watch this in life not death what is the flesh trying to do strip you of your reign the kingdom and life, death. Pride is doing the exact same thing. It knows that grace will produce a reign for you, the kingdom, and it will produce what? Life. So you know what it does? It gets you in pride because only humble people, people who believe God, will see this grace. Prideful people, who are in unbelief, whether that unbelief makes them big in their own eyes or little in their own eyes, it doesn't care. It just wants you looking at you. So it can rob you of God's grace and rob you of the reign, the kingdom, and the life. You see how these two are working directly together? It, the reason I call it a footman, a lynchman, is because you don't recognize when you're in it. You don't even know when you're in pride. When we're carrying care, we're in pride. When we're worried, look, look, go to 1 Peter 5. This is our last verse to, th this morning. Quickly, please. 1 Peter 5, look at this. 1 Peter 5. Look at this. And many times, every one of you know this verse, but we disconnect it. 
we think that it's a separate thought and it's not look at this first Peter chapter 5 look at verse 5 likewise you younger first Peter 5 verse 5 when you have it say I have it likewise you younger submit yourselves unto the elder all of you be subject one to another clothe yourself with what humility why for God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble what happens when you start receiving grace according to Romans 5 17 you start reigning the kingdom in what life right so it wants to keep you from the kingdom and from pride wants to keep you from the kingdom and life. Now watch this. Humble yourself. Be in faith. Trust God. Under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Now God, how do I humble myself? How do, what's a practical way for me to humble myself? What's a practical way for me to not be in pride? We've been saying pride is what? self centeredness focusing on you you whether it's big or little it doesn't care just you focus on you now how's a practical way for me to be humble how can I express my humility to God next verse casting all your care on him how do you know when you're when you're humble when you're casting your care you're trusting him when you are holding on to the care you are seeing yourself as the source I can't give this money I have bills to pay I have responsibility you're being careful instead of not taking care and every time go back and check your history every time you casted your care you didn't know to call it humble you didn't we didn't know it but we were doing it we just said listen God's got to come through we let go and let God that's being humble and every time we held it and we tried to figure it out and we tried to make it work and we tried to do it it fell apart yes. for years it fell apart and then we give it to God and he fixes it and we say well, why didn't we do that in the first place right back to it. every time you worry about it you try to make it right you try to get it fixed it doesn't work Ouch. but whenever you cast it yeah. that's being humble God exalted you. you God came through for you. God opened the door. God bless you. God provided for you. God gave the job. God did it. When you trusted him. Amen. 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 So I close with this. What areas in your life are you not casting your care? Listen to me. That's where you're in pride. What area in your life are you worried? Are you trying to make it work? What area are you not believing and trusting God and letting him do it and just taking him at his word? That's the area that we're in pride. Maybe it's your health. You're worried. You're worried about your health. You're full of care. Let it go. Trust him. We're not saying don't be responsible. Please. You understand. All of you are mature. You understand what I'm saying? Be responsible. Eat the right things. Do the right things. The Bible tells you if you don't know how to eat right, you might as well slit your throat. Book a proverb. Put a knife to your throat if you're given, if you can't control your habit, you're going to kill yourself anyway. We're not saying be stupid. You follow me? We're saying stop worrying. Trust God. Trust God. Stop looking to yourself and realize he healed me. Amen? And every time, yeah, they told Vicky she was going to die. She just laughed. And she's still here today. They gave her 30 days to live. She's still here today. Every time you cast your care, it comes through. Yes. Yes. God, he exalts you. He does it. He holds you up. Yes. But when we, when we worry, it doesn't work. Stop worrying. Start trusting. And God will exalt you. Amen?